welcome to another episode of Lexitecture, a podcast about words by word nerds and for you. My name is Ryan, and in each episode, my friend Amy and I will be talking about our two favorite words of the week, looking at their origins and history, and generally chatting about how they got to where they are today. If that sounds like your cup of tea, come along for the ride and let's explore the weird and wonderful world of the English language. Today's episode, Heckle Loaf. I've forgotten what your word is. You told me and I read it and thought that it had registered in my brain, but apparently not. Uh, loaf. Loaf, yes. Very I'm pleasing excited. to see. I'm excited about this one. Uh, do we want to just uh, jump in? Yeah, let's just get loafing. Do you okay. want to go first? Will I go first? I forgot who went first last time. Uh, I don't remember either. I think I think I went first last time. Cracking was okay. Mm, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't remember. Oh, take it away, loaf. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, First off, the only reason the only reason I bothered looking this up, and this harkens back to um, the snob entry when we got on that little tangent about mouthfeel and whether words mm-hmm. have it. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's pretty clear by now that they do, now that we've said it, and it's been a couple weeks and since recording that. Um, but loaf has always been one of my favorite words, just in the sheer... Like, I mean, it's, it's not a... It's not onomatopoeia because it's not a sound, mm. but it's like if there was a word for onomatopoeia, but instead of saying its name, it says its essence and the feeling it evokes, like a loaf. It's just a light, fluffy word. Do you know, I always say that, that there should be a word for that thing. A, yeah. word, a, a word for words that are onomatopoeic, but that don't make a sound. Yeah. Yes, I may. I may have to like dig out my old Greek primer and see if I can construct a word that would fit that bill. But yeah, who that'd knows? be perfect. Maybe I'm just not learned enough. That should, someone we, should do that because that should. We be a need word. that word. It should yeah. definitely be a word. Because loaf is one of those. So, I looked it up because I was like, I wonder where that. It's it's a strange word. Um, I'm wondering where, it, you know where it comes from and everything else. So mm-hmm. as usual, we turn to the Oxford English Dictionary. Hooray! And it is uh, forever ago. It comes from uh, Germanic. Of course. Uh, and Old English from Old High German and Middle German. Um, and the Old English was, I think, Hlaf or Hlof. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what that vowel is, but it's, you know, the oh, H-L-A speak, with an accent. Speak Old F. Germanic to me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and it's... Uh, but it's interesting because it, the OEDs, I mean, it dates back to both entries are circa sort of 950 and 1050. Okay. So it's 10th century, super, super old. But it's unclear whether it was first used just as a word for bread. It's always been bread. It's always right. had to do with bread. And whether it first meant it was just literally a synonym of bread or if it was the way we use it now, which is as like a, a, a unit of bread, a, a, mm-hmm. a chunk of bread is a loaf. But it's interesting that it's, I'm, nobody seems to be sure whether it went from the general to the specific or if it was once specific and then was general for a bit as mm-hmm. well and then went back to the specific. It's That's unclear. But that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, and otherwise, that would have been the end of it, and I wouldn't have dedicated a whole a whole anything beyond that to this. I would have just been, mm-hmm. oh, look at that. That's kind of interesting. But it means what it means now. It's it's resilient because it's been nearly 1,100 years of a word meaning the same thing that it's always meant, which in itself is a bit weird. Yes. That it doesn't seem and like you know, it's ever changed. I, I also, I, I find myself wondering recently, uh, apologies if I'm interrupting and you want to just tell me to shut up and go on with what you're talking about. <laughs> But no, no. I, I was I found myself wondering lately, so you know, a word like loaf, like you say, it's meant the same thing for a long ass time. But mm-hmm. at some point in time, it must have just been a sound. Yeah. It, someone just made a noise 
Yeah. And, that... and at which point did that sound become that thing? I suppose what I'm talking about is the holy grail of etymology, really. Where does where does the sound become the meaning? Yeah, at what point does just noises become actual words? Yeah, and and, uh, and are there certain noises that, that, you know, are destined to mean those things? For example, sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm side-noting again, but the, there's a reason why the word for mother in so many different languages contains the syllable m in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And it's to do with the development of the soft palate in humans. Yeah, they're all it's, bilabial yeah. stops or it's, fricatives. It's either the ma for mom or the pa for uh-huh. father. And it, essentially it's to do with the fact that these are some of the first sounds that human beings can make. And thus some of the first words that they begin to say. Yeah. And that that kind of blows my mind a little bit. Yeah, I've always Me. I've always liked that. And how mm, they're, they we, are pretty much universal. Yeah. We, we biologically developed to f- f- for those sounds to mean those things. And I, I wonder if there are other examples of that, such hmm. as loaf. Such as loaf. Pray yeah, continue maybe. and I will shut my yap. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's the thing that I find interesting about this now. It's, it's sort of a cheat because I'm kind of working backwards to get to a bunch of different endings. But is how many things relate to variations or adaptations or combinations building on the word for loaf. So, for instance, if you look at the etymology in the OED for loaf, you get to the Old Germanic and the Old English, um, mm-hmm. and it, it sort of is um, hlaf for English, or lieb, or lieb. Um, it says Old High German, Middle High German, but it's like lieb or lieb. Um, old Norse has the same type of thing. Danish Middle Swedish is lev. Uh, there's all these different things. But what's interesting is it talks about, and then it goes into how other words, when you sort of, so uh, the Gothic is hleif, and then whence gachleiba is like a, a comrade or messmate, so someone with whom you share bread. Ah, oh, lovely. Is like a, and then it relates that, which is something I hadn't realized, but of course it makes a lot of sense. To here comes Latin, companio or companion contains that pan, panio, which of is course. in French would be pain, and, and com meaning with, as with a so, so a companion is someone with whom you share a loaf bread. of bread, you share bread. So we get companion, we get all these different, like in German, the messmates and stuff like that. You know, we don't really have mm. it's weird that we took bread and lo- we took loaf from. German, but we took companion in front. We don't really have an equivalent um, word for friend in English, I don't think, other than companion that involves bread, but from that different family line. What was really interesting to me, and this will be the, I'll, I'll finish on this because this was my big, like, what moment when I was looking <laughs> this up, is the word lord, which has as its etymological root the word loaf, because the word lord was originally a a construct, a compound word in English from the words loaf and the word ward or guardian or um, overseer. Oh, this is so exciting. So the lord... The bread guy. The the lord (laughs) of the house was the person who guards the bread and who is the person who is responsible for keeping the bread safe and sound. Oh, this is... So great. The, and all related this to that, talk of high. Oh, uh, go forth, go forth. So one more. It's close mm-hmm. related. Lady. So lords and ladies. Mm-hmm. Lady comes from the com- combination, the compounding of loaf, and this um, this old English word, uh, dej or d d gay or d something along those lines. So it gets the d. From the first syllable of an old English word that means literally neater, K N E A D E R. So a lady was a loaf neater, and a lord was the loaf guardian. Oh, that's so foxy. It's ah, am- it's amazing. Love it. <laughs> so originally, and of course, originally lords and ladies were simply just the, like a lord was just the guy in a house. It wasn't didn't have mm. all these lofty mm-hmm. whatever. 
Yeah, sure. But it all comes back to bread. Whether you're kneading the bread or whether you're supposed to be protecting the bread, that's where Lord and Lady comes in. It's companion is based, friendship is based on bread. Everything comes back to bread. Wow. Do you know, I, I, my, my inner feminist leapt for a second when you said that a lady was a kneader of bread because, you know, the, the interest in social construct of language seemed to be, you know, the, the centuries old idea that men provide and women take sort of thing. But, but no, in fact, women create and men protect, guard. There, yeah. there are some interest in gender social constructs to be taken out of that too. But, but that, is, that is truly wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. Ah, awesome. And so... Yes, what's your... Bring us to your word choice for this this fine day. Well, I decided this week that since my last two words have been not really possible to discuss their etymology because of that that, uh, whole origin unknown thing. Right. And as much as I love that, I do (laughs) kind of feel like I'm shortchanging people a bit to be on an etymology podcast without really pro- providing any etymologies. Right. So I decided to go for one that is a surefire in as much as that concept exists anywhere in the world of etymology. And not only that, but I, I'm feeling very, very sort of rabidly Scottish uh, for, for this episode because it is a word that is of interest to me, not just because of its meaning, but also because its origin is believed to uh, feature my home city, Dundee. Oh, nice. So the word is heckle, H-E-C-K-L-E. Oh, cool. And funny, QI keeps coming up. When I discussed this with my husband, he seemed to think that QI have perhaps talked about the origins of the word heckle. Uh, what what made me think to talk about it originally, at the, the weekend we went to see Ed Byrne playing in Dundee. You know Ed Byrne from things like Mock the Week? He's an Irish comedian. Yeah, I think so. And he talked a little bit about hecklers in his act, as, as comedians often do. And I suspect he's pretty good at putting down hecklers. But this was what this was what kind of reminded me that this word existed and reminded me of its Dundonian connection. So to heckle, um, I'm literally looking at the dictionary with it in front of my eyes and cannot find the word. Ah, there it is. Okay, so the OED gives its definitions as heckle, verb, with object. Its first definition is interrupt, brackets, a public speaker, with derisive or aggressive comments or abuse. The second meaning is dress, flack or hemp, flax or hemp, excuse me, to split and straighten the fibres for spinning. So the, the origin is given as Middle English in sense two from heckle, which was a flax comb, and northern and eastern form of hackle. Hmm. OEDs, the OED continues with the sense to interrupt a public speaker arose in the mid 17th century. And this is an interesting little footnote. It says for the development in sense, compare with tease. So to heckle is to tease out, to comb and straighten and tease out the fibres of flax or hemp, or in this particular case of jute. So Dundee is the city of the three J's, jute, jam and journalism. Jute because of the incredibly large and very, very uh, profitable jute industry that grew up in Dundee. When we were off colonising places, um, Dundee was a good place to manufacture, to to process and and manufacture jute bags and sacking and sailcloth and all the different things that... I'm I'm going to need to just pause you for one second. I I Mm -hmm. believe I I need a Scottish English phrase book for that. What what is that word? What is jute? J-U-T-E. Yeah, what is that? It's a a fibre. It's a fibre that sacking material is made out of. I'm actually, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna have a wee look. I didn't think this was a Scots word, but it, it may be one. It may just I be a, so... a British in more generally. Yeah, yeah British, that's, or, that's true. Or I may oh, just I not know it, which is also Turns out I don't know the alphabet when it comes to <laughs> look things up quickly. 
Is it is it like like a burlap or like a like denim or is it? It's it's the sort of material that a sack would be made out of. In fact, okay. it's the sort of material that hipster weddings love. You know, oh, you're, you're, okay. you wrap yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's brown and you wrap it around stuff. And yes. Okay. They look uh, sort of artsy. Okay. okay. The the OED gives it as jute, J U T E, a rough fiber made from the stems of a tropical old world plant used for making twine and rope or woven into sacking or matting. Okay. And huh. the herbaceous yeah. plant, which is cultivated for this fibre with edible young shoots. So, yeah. In the days of, uh, you know, sail ships, sails were made out of jute and sacks were made out of jute. And in those days, uh, you know, people needed a lot of sacks and they needed a lot of sails. And so Dundee... Dundee is a town, is a city built on jute, and you can still see evidence in the city of large houses that were formerly owned by jute barons. There are parks in the city that were gifted to the city by producers of, of jute, and there were huge mills, some of which buildings certainly still exist. I don't think there's any active jute industry continuing in Dundee, uh, because they realised they could do such things in, in India, where the you know where the plant is is grown <laughs> where um, it already in those is days, yeah indeed in those days it was cheap and it was uh, profitable to to have the the mills running in dundee so very much something that as a as a kid i, w- I was aware of jute mills my granny worked in a jute mill for example hmm. the jam stems from uh, it is alleged that marmalade was invented in dundee this is an apocryphal story, and again in, in the mould of QI, uh, but it, it's it, it's often said that, that marmalade was invented here. And since marmalade doesn't begin with a J, which makes the slogan kind of useless, yeah. I suppose that they converted it to jam. And journalism, the publishers, DC Thompson's, uh, is how still continues to produce uh, various publications. And Dennis the Menace who is not the same Dennis the Menace that North America knows. He has black hair and wears a red and black striped jumper. And Desperate Dan and the the Dandy and the Beano and these comics. It it tends to be the comics that they're famous for. But yeah, so they're publishers. They've published newspapers and magazines and comics in Dundee for a very, very long time. Anyway, so Jute Jam and Journalism. Heckle, to tease out the fibres, to to comb them with a hackle comb or a heckle comb, Heckling was done by hecklers. In other words, there were people in the factories who were employed as hecklers. And Dundee, at one time, was a town known for its radical political views, particularly for its very spirited political meetings. And I, I hear tell that there, there's a, there was a, a tradition within the mills where one man would bring in a newspaper and read it out while the rest of the hecklers would make comments on the news. But it certainly became the case that the the, the mill workers in Dundee were given this reputation of being particularly politically feisty, interrupting speakers, shouting out opinions, and thus the sense to heckle became something that the hecklers did. And as well right. as teasing out the fibres of jute, the hecklers also interrupted public speakers. Huh. So, hence heckling came to be, you know, shouting out in the middle of comedy shows and all the rest of it. And purely, again, it's, it's a little bit of sort of local history, but also because of the, the political aspect of the word. This, uh, this brought me to the other thing that I know about oldie timey politics in Dundee, which is that Sir Winston Churchill was the Member of Parliament for Dundee between 1908 and 1922. He, um, he, he was voted out and drummed out of the city. And I, I, I did a little bit of, of research into this. He, he was initially very popular in Dundee. Okay. He was a Liberal MP, I believe. Um, I might have that wrong because, you know, I'm a human being and I make mistakes. He was very <laughs> popular initially with the Irish working class and... There, there was and there remains a, a strong sort of Irish group within Dundee. Uh, however, he was responsible for calling in troops against a miners' strike. And following the First World War, troops were sent to Ireland after the war. And so, of course, that, that, that kind of damaged this Irish supporter. He also, 
supporters. He also didn't support the women's suffrage movement. And he, he sort of dipped in popularity. Another reason why he was disliked in Dundee, he was perceived to spend very little time there. And he was eventually voted out and defeated by a temperance candidate, a teetotaler who uh, thought that alcohol was sinful and terrible. And th there's a tale that he, that Winston Churchill spent three days in Dundee visiting. And during that time, he spent a thousand pounds, a tenth of which was on liquor and wine. So <laughs> the mood in the city sort of turned against him. He, th there's a very famous occasion where he, he came to speak, he came to visit the city and he was to, due to speak outside the Caird Hall, which is in the, the, the centre of Dundee, but he had appendicitis, he was very ill, so he was carried in a chair. And while I was reading about this, uh, as I was researching heckling, I found a, a rather lovely story told by the actor Brian Cox, who is, of course, from Dundee, and it had been passed on to him by his uncle, who had been in Dundee at, at that time. And apparently the, there were some men carrying this chair, bearing the Member of Parliament uh, along, which makes me think of you know, sort of Roman sedan chairs. And the, the exchange went, how much did he give you to carry him? And the men said, a quid. And the guy said, I'll give you two to drop him. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, but Winston Churchill, Dundonians like to say he was drummed out of Dundee. He was, you know, he was voted out and, and he wasn't a popular guy. And then, of course, the fact that he went on to be Sir Winston Churchill, wartime prime minister. It's kind of, we don't really care about that because once upon a time we kicked him out. That's um, right. So, yeah, w within that atmosphere of, of political opinion and stridently given voice to those political opinions the word heckling was born and it is one that I feel I feel quite quite proud of if you like in a sort of a, a local history sort of way and of course thinking about heckling also led me to to think about well Wikipedia gives this word uh, in its in its uh, entry for heckling apparently if a comedian, particularly a comedian, although politicians do it too, apparently a heckle is fought off with a squelch. And a squelch. that is a squelch. A squelch is the name given to a comeback to a heckle. And okay. in fact, a few years ago, someone gave me a book called Stand Up Put Downs. Uh, it's it's it says on the front it's compared by Rufus Hound, a British comedian, and essentially it's a collection of replies to hecklers by uh, by various comedians, and most of them are uh, pretty. They're 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 pretty spicy. Some of them, yeah. Some of them are quite um, some of them are quite rude as as you would imagine, but um. <laughs> This one, this one I liked. There are quite a few in this book from Ed Byrne. This one in particular comes from Richard Herring, another British comedian. And Richard Herring, in response to a heckler, said, if you're going to come and heckle, be prepared. Don't get so pissed you can't think. That's the first rule of heckling. Second rule of heckling, maybe bring your own amplification system. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's it's oh. a very lovely book. Uh, if if you like seeing and hearing people getting squelched, which was a, a context for that particular word that that I didn't know existed, so I was very pleased to have researched heckling. Yeah, just that's very to, cool. Just to discover that that one can then squelch in return. I also and like that, the connection. Oh, sorry. sorry go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, and that is my word for this week. That's fantastic. I I really like the. Um... I like the heckle and tease connection. Yes, which that was I, kind of a cool thing that it, that they happened to be that a heckler yeah. was also someone who teased, but in completely unrelated, in completely unrelated ways and meanings from the other, sort of the more common of the two words. Well, at annoyingly, least more rhetorically. because because I'm not very good at researching. Annoyingly, the last thing I did before this we started recording this podcast was looked up my word in the OED. Because it was a word that was familiar to me and it was an etymology that was familiar to me, right. I, I knew what I was going to say about it to, to some extent. 
But of course, usually I would start with the OED. And if I had done that when I started my research, I would have also been able to uh, to tell you what I found out about the, the etymology of teas. As such, I only have what I've read to you tonight because, you know, because I read it tonight. So yeah, it's no. perhaps something to, to kind of come back to, to because I, I'd be interested, as you say, I'd, I'd be interested to to see if they are separate, to, to kind of... Um, I mean, my guess would yeah. be that, you know, because when you're teasing something, you're kind of picking at it and mm -hmm. pulling on it and pulling it apart and separating it and disheveling it. And it'd be, they're all kind of metaphorical things that are happening to someone mm -hmm. that you are teasing verbally or psychologically. If you're doing it really well and if you're particularly good at it, you are pulling them apart. Mm. And, and in, in the case of both words, I've, I've just I've quickly just looked up teas. In the case of both words, I also love that these original meanings are now secondary in terms of the, the definition. Yeah. So the word once meant to, you know, to, to process fibres. And in both cases, that's not what it means. I mean, it still means that, but it doesn't mean that first. First, right, yeah. it means to interrupt the speaker or to, you know, to... to and and like you say, metaphorically, you are indeed uh, picking, annoying, uh, making, pulling things apart, and and you know all the things that that, that you said. But it doesn't mean that anymore, although it kind of does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I like that a lot. Excellent, good choice of word. Heckle. Heckle. Thank you. Hey Roger, what do you say? Absolutely. Yeah, poor Roger has been a little bit jinxed uh, of late with the technological breakdowns. However, uh, so heckle is listed as either to be obstructive or to torment. And a heckler, dissentient or hinderer. And if mouthfeel for words exists, then hinderer is like having a hair in your teeth. Yeah, no, it is some very interesting potential to make some really bad mistakes if you're not an English speaker and don't know how to use a, a thesaurus very well. Which I do feel is a shame because it must be hard. Oh, yeah. When someone says to you, here is this wonderful word that will help you with your vocabulary. It's almost as if they say, here, take this, and then go away and go, ha, ha. <laughs> That's right. Good luck, sucker. So some of, some of the others given in this category. So the category is... 702, hindrance, and other verbs. We have hinder, hamper, obstruct, impede, delay. Oh, wonderful. Use Fabian tactics. Oh. I do not know who Fabia or indeed Fabian is, but uh, I, I, I'm going to have to find out some more about him. Yeah. Bother, annoy, inconvenience, trouble, embarrass, disconcert, upset, disorder, derange, trip, trip up, get under one's feet, tangle, entangle, enmesh, ensnare. That's an interesting way to go because, in fact, a heckle is to unenmesh the physical act of, of teasing out uh, the, the, the fibre. Right. Um, yeah, so, so we have lots and lots and lots. Hobble, hamstring, put off, meddle, stymie. Stymie is a good one. Stymie is a good word. I like it. Frustrate, filibuster. Filibuster is interesting too. That's I mean it's it's weird. It's interesting that these kind of show that although the original, like with teas, you're kind of doing the same thing. If you're actually physically teasing, like mm, to yeah. pull apart of the fiber, you're doing the same thing when you metaphorically tease someone. But to heckle, like you say, is to unensnare. But a heckler will often stymie or filibuster. Mm, yeah. A show or a speech. The idea behind it was to ensnare or hobble. Hobble is also a really good word. Um, yes. Someone who's trying to make a point or trying to put on a show, you are hobbling them by just opening your big stupid mouth. And then the other sense, oh, the section given here is painfulness. Again, I'm trying to find heckle within the list. It's a big list. It's a column and a half. No, it's two and a half columns. So, verb, to hurt, injure, harm, pain, give pain, maltreat, rend the heartstrings, corrode, embitter, bully rag, 
There's a word I've never <laughs> heard before. To peeve, miff, ruffle, irritate, needle, sting, chafe or fret. Displease, strike a jarring note, go against the grain. Oh, this is a good one. To strike a jarring note, get on one's nerves, set the teeth on edge, go against the grain. Mm. Give one the pip, give one a pain, get one's goat. Get on one's wick, get up one's nose, get under one's skin. <laughs> oh. I had a conversation recently, an online conversation with someone about regional variations of phrases that mean exactly that. Right. Because uh, I, I had used one and someone had said, whoa, that's a cool phrase, what does it mean? I can't remember exactly what I had said. But what one of my personal sort of colloquial favourites is, it really rips my mitten. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is fantastic. I can't stand him. He rips, he rips my knitting. Or that particular thing really n- rips my knitting. Um, but but yeah, I, I'd be interested to find how many sort of regional and uh, various different ways of expressing annoyance because it's you know it's it's an ins- an essential part of the human condition. Absolutely, we're Absolutely. constantly trying to find ways to annoy you. Yeah, to talk about how annoying someone else is Mm, yeah which again you know to come back to we've said it before which is why Roger has such a wealth of words describing unpleasantness yeah exactly and probably more so than than there are uh, polite pleasant joyful happy words I don't know that would be an interesting PhD project for someone okay so loaf yes interesting the first synonym given for loaf within the, the sort of alphabetical index is head, as in to use one's loaf. Oh. Yeah. Which I That's like quite a lot, but, but hasn't really come up in our discussion so far. Hmm. Also, I've, I've always kind of wondered about that one because heads don't look like bread. No, I've, I've never actually heard that. You haven't? Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, you, you use your loaf, as in engage your brain. Yeah, no, I've never... Hmm. So, the the section that it is given in, 213, noun, the section is titled Summit. So, within words which refer to the physical, anatomical head, you also have summit, sky, heaven meridian, peak of perfection, climax, great divide, spike, apex, cusp, rooftop, plateau. And then we we come into the words that that are used to refer to the physical anatomical head. Pate, poll, sconce, noddle, knob, nut, noggin, cocoa, conch, I think more referring to nose, bonce, crumpet, bean, block, chump, Upper story, belfry, brow, dome, temple, forehead, loaf, brain, grey matter, intelligence, epicranium, pericranium, and so on and so forth. Oh, very interesting. That would be an interesting one to come back to. And, and, you know, the etymology of that particular usage is what I would would like to know a little bit more about. Cool. The second one is cereals. Okay. which, Which makes sense. Yeah. I suppose. And... Oh my goodness, there are so many words in this section because section 301 is food, eating and drinking. Oh jeez. Now, loaf is in here somewhere, however, it includes such gems as guzzling, (laughs) nibbling, epicureanism. Oh nice. Belly. (laughs) Oh good. Victuals. Cud. Oh, so much good stuff here. That's fantastic. Linguistically and uh, culinarily. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, but we, we actually have just huge lists of foodstuffs. Raisin yeah. Sultana. Getting into Dolce Latte, Cambozola, drinks, thirst quenchers, quickies, loving cups, one for the road. Uh, this is a section of Roger that is well worth 
che uh, checking out and taking a look at for the, the sort of socio-cultural reasons that we talked about earlier on, but also just because there are some thoroughly delicious words in here. Yeah, it sounds like it. And the section ends with, Bon appétit, here's health, here's to you, here's mud in your eye, bottoms up, then the hatch, slange, prosit, skull, and finally, cheers. <laughs> And that's it for this episode of Lexitecture. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoyed what you heard, please give us a rating and review on iTunes, and be sure to tell all your word nerd friends about us too. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching Lexitecture, L-E-X-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E. And if you'd like to get in touch with us about the things we talked about this episode, you can send us an email at words at lexitecture.com. Special thanks to the Joy Drops for our theme music, and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye.